Welcome to the Department of Physics Colloquium. Today our speaker is uh, Professor Nuhjevi from MIT. So let me give you some information about his background. And he got his BS degree from Wallace University in the Department of Physics. Then he went to the University of California at Berkeley for PhD. And he got his PhD degree in 2004. Then he worked at uh, Caltech as a postdoc. And then he joined uh, MIT in 2008. Nuh is uh, two years younger than me, and he's an associate professor at MIT now. Today he's going to talk about uh, how to understand the topology of the of using ultra-class spectroscopy. Please give that up for the So I first would like to thank for the uh, invitation and, and introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. I always feel very happy after talking to the people at this end. I some of you also proud that there are very good things happening in Turkey. Okay, so what I'm going to be talking about today is I would like to tell you about some of the experiments that we have been doing in the last five years. These are on, uh, new materials called topological insulators. Uh, so what this picture is supposed to illustrate is the following. You can see there are uh, two electron species here. One is spin up, the other one is spin down, and one is going one way, the other one is going the other way. As you will see in topological insulators, the motion of the, the, the electron is, is coupled uh, to the spin. And what I will be telling you today is by actually using light pulses, you can actually couple to these uh, electrons especially differently, different spins differently. So let me first motivate you, put it into a bigger uh, perspective, and then I'll come back to the bullet this way. So in modern day electronics, we usually, we call it electronic because we use the charge degree of freedom to extend signals. Well, we do use the spin degree of freedom sometimes to store information, but it's mostly the charge degree of freedom. Of course, we also you know, rarely use electron pairs like Cooper pairs to generate and, and transmit electricity without loss, but this is very rare. Now, <coughs> if, when you think about it, today's electronics are limited in a number of ways. For one thing, there is not really a marriage between charge and spin degree of freedom. Uh, we, need, we mostly, as I said, need the charge degree of freedom. And also, the materials that you need to use to make transistors, etc., they really need to be very pure. So they, they need to be uh, you know, free of impurities uh, because uh, the devices that we currently use, they are actually reaching the limit in terms of how many transistors you can actually pack into a very, very small area. I and mean, heating is becoming a problem, etc. So you're always looking for alternative solutions that actually can um, circumvent these challenges. So, Let's go, go, go to the root of the problem. So where does this resistance come from when we uh, talk about it? And the there are two ways of thinking about it. You can think about it classically, and there are impurities in any given crystal. So when you try to send an electron from A to B, you, know, you can think about the way that they're bouncing from impurities very, very simply. Or you can consider this problem in a quantum mechanical way. The way you, you think about it is the following. You send an electron wave, and then these different impurities, they are actually scattered in these waves. And all of these waves, and they are interfering structurally, effectively, diminishing the presence of the electron. So how can you get rid of this problem to implement this you know, so-called uh, the, the resistance? So the idea was uh, that the theorists been wondering is, can you somehow use both the charge and spin degree of freedom to solve this challenge? The answer is, it's very difficult with conventional materials, because in general, direction of the spin is independent of the direction of the momentum. You know, the way electron is going has nothing to do with the, which way the spin points. But what I'm going to try to convince you today is that it may be possible to do this using novel materials called topological insulators. So with this motivation, this is the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to be telling you about what is a topological insulator, what is topological, it's kind of a funny name, what is topological is about a topological insulator, and I will try my best to uh, illustrate you know, that. And then I will tell you two different experiments that we did. In the first one, I will tell you how we map the spin texture in a topological insulator using light pulses. And in the second set of experiments, I will literally show you three-dimensional movies of electronic dispersion in topological insulators. Then I'll tell you what we have learned from this and where we are going. So now let's begin with uh, a short introduction to topological insulators. So when we talk about different phases of matter, we always use a paradigm introduced by Landa. What he said is that a particular symmetry actually 
whether or not it's broken, defines what kind of phases you have. And here, I'm going to say crystal, liquid, crystal, liquid. When you think about it, you know, in a liquid crystal, you have a broken translational symmetry. When you think about magnets, like a paramagnet, and then you have a broken rotational symmetry. In superconductors, you have a broken gauge symmetry. So in every conventional phase of matter, it's actually, it is associated with a broken symmetry. Now, topological insulator does not fit into this conventional paradigm. You, there is really no symmetry that's broken about a topological insulator. So uh, how do I understand a topological insulator? So before I talk about a topological insulator, let me briefly talk to you about conventional insulator. What type of insulator do we have? So a very simple one is an atomic insulator. If you take argon, if you cool it down, you will form solid argon. It will be an insulator because the electrons are localized. They are and uh, there is no conduction, there's, you can think about there's an energy gap in the atomic orbitals between lithium and forest there's an energy gap. You can also think about a, a more familiar type of insulator, a insulator, for example, silicon, let's say. Now, you know, you, you, know, you form the equal there there's an energy uh, bands like this. There is still an energy gap, and this is, again, an insulator because, you know, everything here is filled, this is empty, and there is no conduction. Now, before I explain you topological insulator, I would like to show you first topological state of matter. It's actually not a topological insulator, it's the quantum Hall insulator. This is a, an old phenomenon. It's, it was discovered around the 1980s. Uh, but understanding this helps a lot in terms of understanding what a topological insulator is. So let me walk you through this. So this is the conventional insulator picture that we uh, learned from the previous slide. It had a band gap. Now, in a quantum hole insulator, so-called quantum hole phase, what you do is the following. You take a two-dimensional electron gas, a sheet of electrons, let's say, uh, and then you measure its transport properties. What, what it means is the following. So this is the two-dimensional electron gas. You measure the, the longitudinal resistance and also hole resistance. In it. Uh, so these experiments are typically done in a magnetic field. You put a, a very high magnetic field, usually uh, uh, you know, kind of Tesla or several of Tesla. And then, you know, you study how the electrons behave. So what you observe is the following. When you put the magnetic field, these electrons are going to these cyclotron orbits. So this is, you can see, it's very similar to the conventional uh, insulator. That's why this is called a quantum hole insulator, because the bulk of the sample is actually an insulator. The electrons, you know, from the seventh state, they are actually going to these cyclotron orbits. You can also think about from the uh, from the, the band gap picture, there's going to be a cyclotron gap between different nano levels, so this is actually the gap in your insulator. Now, when you look at the transport of this material, this is what led to the Nobel Prize, essentially. Now, what we're plotting here is both the longitudinal resistance and also uh, uh, the transverse hole resistance. So when you look at the longitudinal resistance, you see something very unexpected. I said that this is a quantum <coughs> hole insulator, but at some particular magnetic field range, you see that the, um, the resistance, the longitudinal resistance is actually going to exactly zero. So somehow, this is supposed to be an insulator, but this, is, this has zero resistance at these magnetic field values. Now, if you look at the longitudinal hole resistance, it's also even more surprising. You can see that there, there are these steps. You know, this is you know, exactly equal to some value. And then you figure this out, one or uh, the resistance, which is the, 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 the sigma, the conductivity, uh, uh, transverse conductivity, sigma x, y, you see that this is actually an integer times e squared over h. So this integer, you know, this could be like 1, 2, 3, and this is so perfect an integer, it's about 1 part in 10 to the, 10 to the 9. So this was a weird effect that, you know, uh, basically uh, required a, a, a fundamental change of thinking but the way you understand this actually is rather conceptually simple. Of course, everything is simple enough to be figured out, but the way you understand this is the following. It turns out that the solution to this problem lies at the boundary of the sample. So what's happening, one way of thinking about what's happening is the following. When you think about these circular orbits, when you get very close to the edge of the sample, the electrons cannot go through complete a uh, full circular orbit. So instead, what they are doing, they're actually going through these skipping orbits. Now, you can quickly realize that the direction of this motion is set by the direction of the magnetic field. If I go to reverse the magnetic field, this direction will reverse. Another thing to realize is that they can only go this way because that's set by 
and we did it here. Now, if I were to represent this in the momentum space, you will see this energy gap, this is the cyclotron cycle gap. But there is also this state that's only going in one dimension that's actually coming from the edge of this atom. Now, one nice property about this is that there are no U-terms on this edge state. Now, if an electron encounters an impurity, it cannot go back because simply there is no state going back. So the only thing that it can do is actually can go around the impurity and keep quiet. Now, this is actually what leads to the zero resistance that I, that I told you about, and that's why really excited people got really excited when they have seen this. Now, of course, this is cool and interesting and exciting, but there's a problem, which is that this happens in very, very low temperatures, you know, nearly Kelvin's typically, and also very high magnetic fields. So, in terms of practical applications, very, very limited. So, now, what theorists have been wondering was, can we somehow realize a state like this at zero magnetic field and at ambient room temperature? So that was really what led to the discovery of the closed point cell. And the answer is yes. And the way you do this is the following. Okay, so in fact, uh, before I go in there, uh, I want to explain what is topological about the quantum hole phase, and then we're going to go to the realizing this state at uh, uh, ambient condition. So now the connection to the topology can consider in the following way. Now, topology is a concept that's borrowed from math, and what it means is the following. Now, there are different shapes, but I mean, this is uh, supposed to be a, a coffee mug, and topologically it's equivalent to a, a donut, because they each have a hole going through them. In fact, you can quantify this, there is a, if you integrate the curvature of this shape, local curvature, around the entire surface, you get an you know, integer, effectively. And it turns out that that integer is the same for this shape and same for that shape. So they have the same topological class. Now, you can draw the same connection to the quantum hall insulator in the following sense. I mean, if I put a slight imperfection here or an impurity, they each have basically the same surface state. So you can also make this mathematically, uh, you know, exactly analogous. You can define a quantity and you can show that for these different types of the samples, they are topologically equivalent to each other. So this surface state, in a sense, is very hard to get rid of. You need to do something violent. Uh, for example, if you bring these two surfaces together, this is not no longer equivalent to this. Or just like a sphere is not equal to um, a, do a donut, uh, because they have the different topological classes. OK. So now let's come back to realizing this quantum hole insulator at MD conditions. So how do I get rid of external magnetic field? Now the idea was. Perhaps we can use spin orbit coupling. So, what is spin orbit coupling? Well, what it is is the following. In the rest frame of the electron, which is going around the nucleus, the electric field due to the nucleus is actually felt like an effective magnetic field. But the nice thing about this is that different spin species will feel <coughs> a magnetic field differently. So, if the number is feeling plus p, the other one is going to be feeling minus p. I'm simplifying some of the things, so I apologize for the extra. Now, so if you think about in which material spin orbit coupling is required, you want a large electric field, that means you want a large Z, you want to maximize the charge. So, what you need to look for is down in periodic table. So, you need to think about these elements where the, the spin orbit coupling is locked. So, now imagine that I can use this magnetic field instead of the external magnetic field in quantum hole phase. What you are going to get is the following you are going to get the quantum. Hall um, effect, but you're going to have two copies of this because the two spin species are feeling a different magnetic field going in the opposite direction. You are going to get two uh, edge states, one for spin up, the other one for spin down. This is called the quantum spin hole insulator. Now, the nice thing is there are still no U terms because even though there's another state going the other way, they have different spin. So they cannot actually scatter to each other. So as long as you have a non-magnetic impurity, they really cannot, you cannot scatter this state to that state. Now if you want to look at this in the momentum space, what you see is that you know there are now two states, one is going the other way, one way and the other going the other way, and they have different different uh, spin polarization. So this was first theoretically suggested, and then the first uh, experimental proof came in 2006 in a uh, mercury telluride, tinium telluride uh, quantum world. And then uh, this was, well, this was the proposal and then experimentally confirmed by Mollenkamp in 2007. 
Now this is still, you can see this is a two-dimensional material, and this edge state is a one-dimensional edge state at the end of the sample. Now, you can imagine that same thing can be found in a three-dimensional crystal, and in this case, you know, instead of an, being uh, an edge state, it's a surface state, so the crystal is, is a three-dimensional bulk crystal, and this state lives at the surface, so for example, if an electron is going this way, it has a surface spin, and, and an electron going the opposite direction, it has the opposite, opposite spin state. So this is the, the three-dimensional version of the 2D uh, topological space. Now, if I were to represent this in the momentum space, instead of just two lines like this, what I'm going to get is a cone. This is the dispersion of the surface state. And you can see that the spin of the electron is perpendicular to its momentum. Okay, so the spin would look like they are actually you know, going around the circle like this. All right, so now a couple of properties about this. Uh, this is a two-dimensional state now. This, uh, in, the, in the other case, this was a one-dimensional state. Now this is a 2D state. And this is immune to the strong disorder. So again, an electron cannot directly backscatter because it has a different spin state. And then, now we have an intimate connection between charge and the spin. Actually, the, the motion of the charge is coupled to the direction of the spin. And then, if you are familiar with graphene, it has the same direct dispersion, but with one additional thing, this is a topological version of the, of the, of the, of the graphene. Now we have also the spin momentum coupling. So, um, these are, you know, this is, for example, a business selenite crystal, which is known to be a three-dimensional topological instrument. These are some other examples. You can see there are heavy elements where the spin of the coupling is strong. And in summary, what it is is a topological insulator is an insulator in the bulk. It has an energy gap. And it has a metallic state at the surface. And for this metallic state, the spin, direction of the spin is perpendicular to the direction of the momentum. Now, let me put down unique properties of these materials, and then we are going to see why they are important. So one of them is this spin-momentum locking, the fact that spin is perpendicular to momentum. And one consequence of this is the following. If you were to run a current through this material, you are necessarily going to create an imbalance in the two spin species, and you can see that this will lead to a magnetization. So you can run a current and generate a magnetization, and you can reverse it by running a current in the other way. As I said, there is no backscattering. This guy cannot go here because the spin space does not match. So this, in principle, will lead to higher mobilities. Also, there are other materials where they have surface space and you know, in the surface. But usually, when you put a little bit of junk, you will, you can get out these surface space. But here, you cannot do that. These surface space are topologically protected. They have to be there. You know, they are protected by time reversal symmetry. So as long as you don't have any magnetic disorder, this surface state will be there. You cannot get it. The funny thing is actually that these materials are also uh, very good thermal electrics. And these, you know, the, the group for who, which first discovered this is in Princeton, and they were studying these for their thermal electric properties. And then they were doing art tests, as I will explain what it is. But they, then they see this surface state that they cannot get rid of. So for them, it was the annoyance. They didn't know about this theory. But then later they figured out that that was the important thing. And that it has a funny uh, beginning like that. Now, this is a, a resource field that's booming. Uh, the red bars are theoretically predict predicted topological insulators. And the blue ones are experimentally confirmed ones. So there's two things you can see from this plot. Number one is this is exponentially increasing. And number two, we can see that theory is leading this field. So theorists are always predicting something, and then the experimenters are you know, trying to confirm and, uh, and these predictions. It's very opposite to the, uh, for example, strongly correlated electron systems, where experimenters find something, and then theorists are trying to understand. So why is this interesting in terms of uh, technological applications? So there are a number of different ideas, but let me just mention, for example, four of them. So, Number one is the following. It turns out that when you interface topological insulators with other phases of matter, for example, if you put an S-phase conventional superconductor on top of a topological insulator, at this interface between a topological insulator and an S-phase superconductor, a new type of excitation called Majorana fermions will appear. So these excitations are they are very elusive, uh, just like the person who uh, predicted that they would exist. And Majorana was an Italian physicist, and um, 
He boarded the ship in Italy and no one ever heard back from him. We don't really know where he did it. So one thing about Majorana Fermion is that they are their own anti-particles. So usually you have the electron and photon and for them, uh, they are their own, and they are predicted to play an important role in quantum computation. Now another interesting uh, application, so-called, is external electrodynamics, and one, one uh, uh, interesting uh, manifestation of this is the fall. We all learn that there are no magnetic monopoles in nature, right? But it turns out that if you bring an electric charge near the surface of a topological insulator, the image charge that's formed inside the topological insulator, if you calculate the field with magnetic field distribution due to this charge, it turns out that it's identical to a magnetic monopole. So you can essentially realize a magnetic monopole on the surface of a topological insulator. There are other, you know, spintronics applications. You can make spin downs by putting star magnets on top. Or there's you know, exotic proposals that you can actually make um, and both not you know, exciton condensate, basically, you know, taking electrons and all the two different sides of the uh, topological set. This is actually long, I just picked four of them, but there's many, many others. Okay. Now, now that I've given you all the excitement and applications, etc., now what I want to show you is what are the challenges in this new field? So what are people thinking about and what are the current problems? There's actually many of them, but let me just list a couple of them. So for one thing, I told you that this is a topological insulator and it's insulated in the bulk, but it turns out that in as grown materials, the bulk also comes out to be dope. So necessarily there are some uh, you know, dope in the bulk, and then what that leads to is bulk is also conducted. So one problem is how are you going to separate the property of the surface from the bulk? If you do transport, if you run a curve, it turns out that most of the curve is going to the bulk. So you, it's really hard to learn about the, the surface. The other one is this spin momentum locking that I mentioned, you know, the fact that the spin is part perpendicular to the momentum. Nobody really knew how this effect survives in real materials. This is theory that they should be perpendicular, but to what degree they are perpendicular? And do they, do they stay perpendicular under different conditions? I will come back to this later. And then how are the surface and bulk electrons are coupled to each other? How are they scattered? Uh, you know, uh, the other one is what happens when you put an external perturbation, like when you shine light onto them or when you pass a current, how does the property of these materials change? So, you know, basically we focused on these challenges. And uh, if you think about the, the current work uh, that has been done on these materials for the past five or six years, most of the techniques that are used are angle result for emission spectroscopy or scanning tunnel in microscopy. So the common thing about these two things are their surface probes. You know, ARPES and SPM, they are very sensitive to the top layer on the surface. I mean, that makes sense because we are trying to study a surface state, right? Uh, and also those transports, and they, they need to do different checks to uh, you know, separate the, the, the surface and the ball. Now, what I do is I do optics. I, I use light pulses. Now, I want to argue that the, the optical methods have a number of advantages over the other techniques. For example, you can do spectroscopic information, you get spectroscopic information. You know, you can actually think about coupling to the spin momentum marking using some magnet of optical effects. And with ultra-fast light pulses, you can also do time result uh, measurement, etc. Now, of course, the challenge about using optics is, as I mentioned, you need to separate the bulk electrons from the surface electrons. I mean, anytime you do an optical measurement, light penetrates, you know, several tens of nanometers, and that's already a bulk measurement, because the surface state we are talking about is less than a nanometer. So even though optics is a great probe, the first obstacle that we need to actually um, um, tackle is how are you going to couple directly to the surface state and separate the bulk? Now what I want to do now, I want to show you two, three slides illustrating how we use nonlinear optics to actually separate surface from the bulk, and then I will come back to the, the main topic of my, my uh, presentation. So what we did is the following. We realized that if you do second harmonic generation, so meaning that if you shine light at a frequency omega, and look for light that is coming at twice the frequency, it turns out that in crystals that have inversion symmetry, if the crystal in the bulk has an inversion symmetry, it turns out that from the symmetry arguments, this second order generation should vanish from the bulk, okay? 
Now, of course, at the surface of the material, the inversion symmetry is necessarily broken at the surface, right? Therefore, you will get two omega coming only from the surface of this material. So this actually trick allowed us to directly study the surface of a topological uh, insulator. In this case, of the business cell, and you can see that this is, when you clean this material, this is what the top layer looks like. And then here is our pattern when you rotate this crystal and measure two omega that come, coming out, you can see it is directly mapping the surface uh, band on the crystal. So this is one way you can use nonlinear optics to study photolytic In fact, we took this one step further and we used uh, pump probe spectroscopy in the following sense. We shine a pump pulse that is uh, you know, extracted from the same, same laser pulse. And then we excited both the surface and bulk electrons, and we came with a probe pulse. Now, in the, in the case of the probe, you can measure two things. You can either look at the change in the intensity of the <coughs> fundamental, the same frequency guy, or you can look at twice the frequency. So this guy <coughs> gives you information about the surface, and this guy gives you information about the bulk. And you can see that they are different. So this is another way you can even compare the dynamics of the surface and the bulk. Now, the reason why I mentioned these to experiment is because I wanted to give you an idea that it is possible to separate surface from the bulk using nonlinear optics. Now, I'm not going to talk about these experiments, you can read more here, but the truth is though that you still need to circumvent some other challenges, and, and namely, we really don't know in the previous experiment how we can directly couple and manipulate the spin momentum one. This is uh, after all, is the most interesting property of a topological insulator, the fact that spins are perpendicular momentum. So I really need another technique that can tell me the spin information in the momentum space. And then I want to understand how these surface electrons are scattered, scattering with other electrons. And with optics, all you are measuring is like reflectivity of transmission. It's a little bit hard to go back and understand what happens in the real space. Now, what we end up doing is, Basically, we combine ultrafast optics with RTES and transfer, and, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the next section. So, what I want to talk about next is how we use light to probe the spins in the topological insulators. Now, let me remind you again that. Um, okay, so <coughs> first, let me tell you who did the work. The experiments are done by two of my graduate students, Yuha Wang and James McIver. In fact, Yuha was my first graduate student, and he just graduated and moved on to Stanford as a postdoc. And then uh, David Shade was one of my postdoc, uh, who was involved in both of these experiments. David stayed with me three years, and now he also moved on. He's now an assistant professor at Caltech. So uh, the materials are drawn by two groups at MIT, uh, groups of uh, Yang Li and Harry Herrero at MIT. And we did uh, this work in collaboration with Mayan Fu, and the funding was uh, provided by these uh, institutions. Okay, so now let's remember the ideal topological insulator. In an ideal topological insulator, you have this direct comb, just like graphene, and then you have these spins going around. This is the ideal the, 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 the <coughs> topological insulator. The Hamiltonian effectively can be expressed like this. Now, in reality, though, this ideal direct comb does not exist. If you look at real topological insulators, you can see that at low energies, it does look like a comb, but as you increase the energy, first you see that this circular cross section looks like a hexagon, okay? And then at even higher energy, this looks like a snowflake. So what really happens here is that, you know, this is the ideal topological insulator, but at, at higher energies, there's an additional term that's allowed by symmetry, this like this KQ. Um, now, what this does, this actually distorts your constant energy contours from being a circle to hexagon and to snowflake shape. In fact, in real topological insulators, they are usually low, so you are usually either this regime or this regime. So one open question was, how does this affect the spin momentum locking? Are the spins still perpendicular to the momentum or not? So for this, we need to be able to measure the spin in momentum space. So the, the conventional technique in measuring the dispersion in the momentum space is photoemission spectroscopy, angle result photoemission spectroscopy. And conceptually, it's very simple. You shine high energy light, and you look for electrons that are coming out. And by measuring the electron energy <coughs> and momentum and knowing the energy of the light, you can work back and you can calculate what must be the energy and momentum of the electron inside the solid. Now, traditionally, these experiments are done using hemispherical analyzers that look like this. So the electrons that come out from your uh, sample, they are 
drive it into this detector. And then these are two concentric spheres, and these electrons are guided into a two-dimensional detector at the end. So one com component of this detector gives you the energy of these electrons. The other component gives you one component of the momentum, for example, let's say kx. So the, the data that you get looks like this. This is energy. This is kx. And you can see this is the, 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 the uh, surface state of a topological insulator. And here you can see the bulk state a little bit. This looks like a parabola here. Now, of course, one thing you see here is that uh, you can only measure one component of the momentum, kx. To get ky, what you do is you rotate your sample and then measure again. You rotate again, you measure again. And you have to go through this rotation at different um, you know, angles to map out the entire building zone. Now, for us, not only measuring the dispersion, we also want to get the spin. And the way to get the spin is the following. You actually put a hole in your detector. You need to punch a hole here, which amounts to selecting a certain energy and a certain momentum. Okay, And then you take these electrons that are going through this hole, and you let them be incident on a target, a high Z target that has a, a high spin orbit coupling. Now, depending on the, the spin state of these incoming electrons, they either go to left or right. Okay, there's an asymmetry uh, because there's spin orbit coupling. So from this asymmetry, you can actually deduce the, the spin state of the electron. But now you can imagine that this detection only tells you the spin state of the electron at a given energy momentum point. So if I summarize this conventional artist technique, it looks like this. So at a given orientation of the sample, you knock out electrons, you go through the semi-spherical analyzer, you get a cut through the brilliant zone, and then you rotate your sample, and then you actually get these different slices that the other momentum component. And then if you want to get the spin on top of this, for each one of these points, you do this mode detection, and then you can you know, tell this is a spin up, this is a spin down. But each one of these points takes a few hours to record, and you, know, you can only do so many of them. And then, for us, we also want to do time result measurement. In other words, we didn't just want to measure the sample in equilibrium, but we want to take sighted with a light pulse, and then see how these things evolve. So this type of detection was not possible for us. It was really out of question. So that's why we actually developed a novel way of doing these measurements at MIT. So our detection is very different. It doesn't work like this conventional hemispherical analyzer. The way it works like this. We have a time of flight cube. It's a long, about a meter long uh, empty cube. We use a laser pulse, and the initial is at 1.5 dB. We quadruple it, generate a full harmonic. So now we are at 6 dB above the work function. And this pulse comes in onto the sample. Now, it ejects electrons out, but because it's a short pulse, these electrons that are coming out, they have a very well-defined time of ejection. Okay? And then, we measure the time it takes for these electrons to hit the detector. From this time, we get their energy. We have a two-dimensional delay line detector here, and we know exactly the x and y positions that they hit. So from these x and y positions, we get both kx and ky. So without needing to rotate our sample, this is the, the type of uh, data that we get. So this is energy, this is kx, this is ky. And then you can see that you know, in the previous case, you have to really rotate and catch them together. In our case, we can directly see a three-dimensional detection like this. So to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time any, you know, anybody did three-dimensional band mapping in any material. You can see this is the direct home, and this is the, the, uh, the box space here. This is the parallel thing. You can cut it like vertically or horizontally, you can see that, for example, if I, this is the Fermi level here, you can see that the, this is the, the hexagonal warping that I was talking to you about. This is the, the fact that this is no longer a circle at high energy. <coughs> or you can cut it like this and you can see the surface space and the bulk space right here. Now, it is great that you can see these things in three dimensional way. But the next question is, how do you measure the spin? I don't want to do this mod detection because it's very time consuming and you can only do it at a, at a given point. Now instead, what we did is the following. We used the circular and the polarized light. And we used the following fact. So this pattern was taken with a linearly polarized light. But imagine what would happen if you used circular polarized light. Now you can have right circular polarized light or left circular polarized light. Now the fact that these bands are spin polarized, this is as if this is spin up, this is spin down. Now you can imagine that these transitions that you're going to engage with right and left, they're going to have different matrix elements. So the question is, perhaps we can use the difference between right and left to figure out exactly what must be done to line spin polarization. 
So that's the experiment we did. We shine right circular polarized light and left circular polarized light and took the difference. And this is what we see. So light comes in like this. And then what we are looking at, the pattern that we obtain with right circular polarized light and left circular polarized light. So light means zero. There's no difference. And this <coughs> makes a lot of sense because bulk space is supposed to be speed degenerate and there's no difference. So that's good. And you can see that you know, here is red is negative. You can see is here is red, here is also red. So this is the same spin, uh, you know, uh, information. And then here is blue, here is blue. So this has at least qualitatively, you can see that this is related to the spin texture. So the next thing was, how do I make turn this into a quantitative spin information? Now, you know, after all, this is great that it looks like this, but I really want to understand at a given energy momentum point which way the spin is pointing. Of course, there was other things that we didn't understand at the moment. For example, here's a little bit red here, which is supposed to be blue. Here's a little bit blue there. We didn't really know what these are coming from. Now, to turn this into a quantitative spin information, we did some theory, a simple theory. Uh, this is the Hamiltonian with spin orbit coupling. And then we added light as perturbation. This is the vector potential of light. And then what we did is we actually calculated the matrix elements for light and less circular polarized light. And what we showed is that these matrix elements are actually linked to the expectation values of S x, S y, and S z. Expectation values of values of distant components of the spin. Now, I don't want to go into the specifics of the theory, but fortunately, there's actually an intuitive way I can explain how this theory works. So at the end of the theory, what we found was the following. This difference in intensity between right and left is related to some material specific constant alpha times the expectation value of Sx, the uh, x component of the spin. These are the vector potentials of light, plus some other constant times Sz, uh, the z component of the, of the spin. Of course, in an ideal topological insulator, the spin is R in plane, uh, so Sz should be zero, but nobody really knew what happens at higher energies when you have this external work. So the way you can understand this equation is the following. You can see that the, the light is coming by a 45 degree angle like this. And for circular the polarized light, you know, this uh, angular momentum is going to be along this k vector. So in this coordinate system that I have, it's going to have components along x and along z. So it's not surprising that it will couple to sx and sz. And that's exactly what this is saying. So, but one thing is, you know, that means what we are measuring is some mixture of sx and sz. So the question is, how do you separate them? How do you get independently S, X, and C? The way we did it is we use the symmetry of this crystal, this Nusselian crystal. So the idea is the following. So when I think about the momentum space, let's say I measure a spin here. It will have some in-plane, some out-of-plane component. Now, this crystal has three-fold rotational symmetry, which means that if I look 120 degree away, I should have the same in-plane spin, the same out-of-plane spin. Now, it also has time reversal symmetry, which means if I go from K to minus K, the spin has to reverse. So this both in-plane and out-of-plane components reverse. Now, if you compare these two, which are 60 degree away from each other, you can see that the in-plane components are the same, but the out-of-plane components are different. They are exactly opposite of each other. So all we had to do was rotate our crystal 60 degrees, and then measure again. And you can see that the in-plane will stay the same, but the out-of-plane will change sign. So now, this time, you will have the same in-plane, but the out-of-plane will change time. And then you can see you have two things. You have two equations and two unknowns. You can just add and subtract. So the addition will give you Sx, the x component of the spin. The subtraction will give you Sz. And that's what we did. This is the, uh, the addition. And this is the subtraction. So a couple of things here. So now what we are looking at, the component of the spin at all energy and at all momentum. So this angle is the angle around the, the Fermi control, let's say. You can see that Sx looks like sine theta, consistent with the fact that spins are going around the circle. And Sc looks like it has a different periodicity. It has, you know, it goes like up, down, up, down, up, down. So the spins are tending out and into the plane. They follow the same periodicity as this hexagonal distortion, which is interesting. And then you can also get SY by doing the same analysis after rotating your sample by 90 degrees. So if you look carefully to these patterns, you know, if you look at SX, as I said, you know, above the direct point, you know, let's say it looks like sine theta, 
Uh, and then, as you know, below the direct point, it's just the negative as it should be. And whereas S y, if this is like sine theta, the other one goes like cosine theta. So this is consistent with the fact that spins are rotating around the circle. That's what you should get when you look at two different components. This is at low energies, within plus minus 100 MeV of the direct point. Now, if you, you can do something fun. You can actually project all these spins into the plane. And these are real measurements. So what we are looking at here is the spin of the electron at any given kx, ky point. You can see, you can literally see the electron spin going out in, in an helical sense, or taking in a helical sense. This is above the direct point. It goes one way. And below the direct point, it goes the other way. Now, if you look at Sz, the z component of the spin, in an ideal topological instance, this should be 0. In fact, if, if you look around the direct point, it is zero. But if you uh, first, if you actually, if you look at the periodicity at high energy, you see that it actually has the same periodicity as the uh, hexagonal uh, warping. Uh, and if you plot the amplitude of this SZ, it has some characteristic shape, okay, like this. It turns out that it was predicted that this hexagonal warping the fact that the constant energy contour becomes not a circle but an hexagon should lead to a z component of the spin. And in this theory, there was only one free parameter. That was this a. So k is the momentum. A is the strength of this hexagon working. Now, if we fit our data to this model with one free parameter, we get a perfect fit, saying that this experiment that we did you know, is in perfect agreement with this guy. So if I Summarize this, around the direct point, we see the ideal topological and behavior. The spins are going in a helical sense. And at high energy, when I have this hexagonal warping, what the spins are doing are they are camping out and into the plane like this. And this is real data, by the way. And of course, the other thing that you know about this is before, it was only possible to spin to measure the spin at a given energy momentum point. And then to measure somewhere else, you have to rotate your sample. But now you can get the spin at all energy momentum values at once. We repeated the same experiment in a different topological state that has a stronger uh, warping. Now it looks like this is this looks like a hexagonal hexagonal warping is much more stronger. You can see that the same effects are there. In fact, uh, this is the three-dimensional representation of that data. Okay. Now, after we did this experiment, we were thinking about this and we realized the following. Now, if indeed, when we shine light, we can couple differently to the different side of the cone. So effectively, by shining right versus left circle of the polarized light, we are preferentially exciting one side of the cone more than the other one. But when you think about this, this should lead to a current. Because after all, what you are doing is you are depopulating this part more than the other, so there should be a current. In fact, this curve should be perpendicular to your incidence plane. So we did this experiment, and we looked for this current that, you know, that would run perpendicular to this incidence plane. And the way you can check this, you can check right versus left, and this curve should reverse. And indeed, we did see that the, the, the current is different between right and left of the quality. And we can read more about this here. OK. So the experiments that I told you so far illustrated that in an ideal topological insulator, you can actually A, map the band dispersion in a three-dimensional sense, and B, map the spin texture in a three-dimensional way. And then we can also see a curve associated with this effect. In the next five or 10 minutes, what I want to show you, actually taking one step further, now, instead of getting static pictures like this, I would like to show you that we can actually make movies with half to second time resolution. So how do we do this? The way we do this is the following. So by the way, this is a three-dimensional representation of the chambers that uh, we designed at MIT. And this is the real thing. You can see this is, this is the time of flight analyzer that I was sending about. And this is our chamber where the sample sits here. And in terms of the sketch, it looks like this. This is where the sample sits. And so far, I was just telling you about this beam. This is the fourth harmonic of 1.5 EV light at 6 EV that ejects electrons, and then we measure them here. Now, one thing you can do, you can do pump pro spectroscopy in the following way. You can separate part of this laser pulse and then use this as an excitation beam. So you can first excite your sample, and then you can take snapshots of the electronic dispersion at different times. So the idea is, by changing the time delay between these two pulses, I can measure this dispersion either before I excite the sample or after, or after a specific time. 
And then I can put all these static patterns, patterns side by side, and then, then I effectively make a move. So let's see one of these moves. This is the static pattern that I showed you. And now what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be adding this pump knee, excitation knee, and then we'll change this time delay, and then we'll just put these all side by side. So the best way to illustrate this movie, actually, is plot the difference movie. So what I want to do is I want to subtract out the equilibrium state. So before time zero, which is the time where these two pulses are hitting the same time. Now, the, the reason why I want to plot the difference movie is because I want to show you the changes made by the laser, right? So before I show you the movie, let's think about what, what, what do we really expect. So if I look here, you know, indeed, the, the reason why I stop here is because this is the Fermi level. I mean, there are more states here, but they are unoccupied. So our test cannot see them because in the test, you are just knocking on an electron. There are no electrons here, so you cannot see them. So that's the Fermi level. It's, in fact, you know, our test is an old technique in condensed matter, but it's always known to be a probe of occupied space. You cannot see unoccupied space in our test. Now, of course, when you shine light, in the excitation light, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be populating these unoccupied states. So you can imagine that we are putting electrons here, and then as time goes on, they will come, they will come back. So now let's look at the difference moving. This frame is 4.25 picoseconds before a laser pulse hits the sample. So you see nothing, that's good, because there should be nothing, there's no change. But now, let's see what happens after I excite the sample. So red means positive, blue means negative. You can see that after the excitation, I'm populating the space here, and then depopulate the going around this one more time. So let me stop here. So after a laser, the laser pulse hits, you can see that I'm depopulating space here, and then populating space there. So a couple of things to be said here. One of them is, now you can also see unoccupied space. So that's great, because in our case, you cannot see them. But now I can occupy the unoccupied space with light, and then see their dispersion. But number two is, I can actually follow these electrons as they, as they relax. For example, right here, you can see that this is a Fermi level, and this looks like a broadened Fermi distribution here. So you can actually directly fit this, and you can get the temperature. Um, now, uh, and then you can you know, analyze this rate as a function of uh, energy, and momentum, etc. Now, here is a cut. This is a regular movie. It's not a difference <coughs> movie. You can see that after the excitation, the populate stays here. And then as time goes on, they relax back to the equilibrium state. Now, what you can also see a little bit is you are also populating the bulk space, not just the surface space. Now, let me tell you what we have learned from this movie. So if I put the frames from this movie, it looks like this. This is you know, before the excitation. This is you know, a second after. And these are different times. You can see that I can follow the population of the bulk and also at the surface. And then I, I can also follow uh, you know, up to uh, you know, back going back to the equilibrium. Now, what you could do is you, know, you can actually momentum integrate them. If I just collapse all the momentum, you can see this is a Fermi level and populating space about, and then they are relaxing back down. And the simplest way to think about this, effectively what I'm doing is I am increasing the, I am changing the temperature and also the chemical potential of the system. So I can think about a time-dependent temperature and a time-dependent chemical potential. And I can fit to this, this model. And the fix actually uh, you know, works great. And the nice thing is that I can separate the bulk space from the surface space. Because in the momentum space, I know exactly where they are. So what that means is that I can get a temperature for the surface state and also for the bulk state. Similarly, I can get a temperature, uh, chemical potential for the surface state and also for the bulk state. So um, now, when you get these quantities, the temperatures for the surface and the, and the bulk state, what you can do is you can look at these temperatures and you can see how they relax. And you can learn something about how the surface and bulk electrons are coupling with each other. So let me show you this. Now, we first did an experiment at 15 Kelvin. So we pulled the sample down to 15 Kelvin. And we did the, the, the experiment that I showed you. And we do these fits and we get the temperature of the surface electrons and temperature of the bulk electrons, the red and blue. Now you can see that the temperature, electronic temperature, rises up to 1,000 Kelvin. That makes sense because we know the energy of the light that we are, uh, we are. We know the energy in the light pulse that we are putting in. We know the electronic heat capacity. When you do the math, it should rise up to 1,000 Kelvin. Now, this is the electronic temperature. Of course, the lattice temperature does not rise that much. It only rises about 10 Kelvin because the lattice capacity is not as, as small. Now, the other thing that you notice here is that the two temperatures, the surface and the bulk temperatures, they are not at equilibrium even after 15 picoseconds. 
Now, at first, when I saw this data, I said, perhaps this is our noise. Right? We cannot measure the temperature that well, and maybe that's why they, they look like they're not in the fluid here. But it turns out that that's not the case. If you do the same experiment at 300 Kelvin, you can see that you know, they are exactly the same with each other. So something is preventing the two populations coming into equilibrium at low temperature. And the surface and the bulk somehow cannot really talk to each other at low temperature. So another thing you can get learned is from the chemical potential. So this gets slightly technical, but uh, that's the only place this gets uh, technical in part. So here, there are four curves here. So what it is is that, first of all, red is the bulk, and green is the surface, OK? So this is what is measured. So this uh, is the measured chemical potential change in the surface, and this is the measured chemical potential change in the bulk. You can also see there are some dash curves here. And what it is is the following. So for those of you and the students taking full state course, you know you must know that chemical potential can change because of two things. A, if you change the number of electrons in the system, or it also depends on temperature. As you vary the temperature, chemical potential changes. Now, these dash curves are calculations assuming that the number of particles stays constant in each subsystem. And chemical potential only changes because temperature is changing. So effectively, we said the following. If chemical potential is only changing because we are changing the temperature like this, what would be the expected change in the chemical potential? So what you can see, these are the dash curves. For the surface, is exactly the same, indicating that the surface particle number is not really changing because it's exactly agreeing with the temperature change. But for the bulk, it is saying that this is different from this guy. It must be that the bulk particle number is changing. So what this means in English is the following. When you do this optical excitation, it mainly excites across the bulk. And that's why bulk particle number is changing. Then you are just heating the surface. Okay. Now, if you come to the room temperature, the story is different. You can see that. Also in the surface, you can see this, this guy is different from the expected from the temperature change. Particle number in the surface is also changing. Okay? Now what does that mean? It means the following. It means that at room temperature, there are phonons around. And even though initial optical excitation is exciting across the bulk, phonons actually can scatter these excitations to the surface state. And then that's why you can also you know, change the particle number in the surface. In fact, if you look at the two populations, these are, these are the changes in the particle number for the surface and for the bulk. You can see that the surface state is actually is delayed a little bit. That's because the, the electrons are scattered from the bulk via phonons. Whereas at low temperature, there are no phonons around. So you, you can have a decoupling between surface and bulk. And that's why these two populations don't come to equilibrium. The temperatures are different even after 15 people say. So uh, now, this is actually, we have tested this in many different samples. This is a different doping sample. You can see this more dramatically. At 15 Kelvin, they are very different. At room temperature, they are exactly the same. And this is the same effect. Now, last thing I'm going to tell you is, we also studied the doping dependence, okay? Meaning that we look at the samples that are doped in different levels. So this is the box state. So either look at doping here or there, there, there. Changing the number of uh, electrons in the system. What we found is that if you look at the surface temperature as a function of time, it looks like there are two steps. There's a fast decay that really does not care about the goal. And there's a slow decay that changes the rate of this decay changes uh, depending on the doping. Now, why is that? So if I plot this slow rate as a function of 1 over tau 2 as a function of energy, it follows this E cubed behavior. Okay, the energy is from the direct one. Now, it turned out that you know, Alan McDonald did this calculation for graphene. He actually considered different low graphene and he calculated the cooling rate for the electrons. And what he predicted was that if these electrons are cooling by emitting acoustic phonons, he predicted that this rate should go, should go like E2. And this is exactly what we are observing in a different material but in the same story. Now, this other fast rate, it turns out this is the optical phonon emission, and when the energy of the electrons you know, go below the optical phonon energy, in this case it's around here, they can no, no longer emit this optical phonon, so they have to really cool by emitting acoustic phonon, which goes like E2. And if you look at the, the bulk, bulk does not do that because it has a different type of dispersion. It, doesn't, it really is independent of the energy almost. 
At room temperature, you know, again, because surface and bulk is coupled, you don't see this effect. You only see this effect when you cut, decouple the surface and bulk at, um, uh, at the low temperature. Now, these measurements are, are very important because um, you know, nobody really knew how surface and bulk electrons are coupling to each other. But this experiment exactly tells you that the coupling is mediated by hormones, and you can actually turn this off at low temperature. So in summary, I told you about three different experiments, essentially. In one of them, I told you how we measure the 3D dispersion and how you can get the 3D spin texture. And then I mentioned that we can also measure this so-called uh, um, photocurve, helicity-dependent photocurve in a topological insulator using this effect. And then I showed you how we can make three-dimensional movies of the system. And I want to leave you with this picture of my Google Thank you very much. Thank you. So if I go back to the movie, um, okay, so I have to just go to the here. Okay. You can see that initially, this is kind of you know early, okay? Initially, I am shining a 1.5 EV pump, which means that I can excite you know 1.5 EV below the Fermi level. So this is all blue initially, because it's a non-thermal uh, distribution. And um, this, you know a certain time then they thermalize and they move to uh, near the surface formula. But this is right that you know, this is 1.5 in here. It's set by the light measure, right? If you use a, a smaller light measure then this is a small unit. Of course now you can think about applying the same technique to different materials. The technology doesn't have to be done. Any other question? Uh, are, are these surface states uh, confined to a single monolayer at the surface? Um, now, when you look at the crystal structure of business selenite, it actually grows like quadruple layers, there's five layers, and roughly the, the size of the surface state is you know, one quadruple layer, so it's about an, 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 like one nanometer, like the cannon stroke. It's you know, set by the, the bulk band gap and it's only the loss. The current, I mean, what is the current? Even in the heavy speed driven yes. experiment. Yeah, so um, now it's supposed to be theoretically, I mean, first of all, this heavy speed driven current is not unique to topological insulator. In any rush pass system, if you set, separate the spin, the two different spin species in principle, you can, you actually, people have done the impression for the past 10 years, you can get these heavy speed curves. But, the nice thing about this system, in the rush pipe game, you actually do get some cancellation because you get a different spin spin going different ways. But in this case, you only have one spin going this way, the other spin going that way. So theoretically, at least, you must have a much bigger curve in this system compared to rush pipe. I don't really have the numbers, but uh, theoretically, this should be much, much bigger. That was my problem exactly. Should we compare with the no, I mean, in graphene, you can't read it. I mean, there's no, the spin over coupling is not that big. But the current levels? Yeah, but they're not, they're not going to spin polarize in graphene. You can think about an interesting case where you couple with graphene that opposes Bruce later and then do this and then inject spin polarized curve into that. All right. So we can continue the discussion outside. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. And we have